and, and was fired um, from working there in June after I had reported fraud and infiltration into the organization. But I would have to give you some like serious background information in order for you to understand this like complex conversation, um, situation rather. For them while residing in Brooklyn? Yes, they are a national organization, so and a virtual one. So they work across um, the country uh, virtually. So a lot of my colleagues were uh, across the country, Chicago, Minnesota, California, New York, like that, Philly. They're a not-for-profit organization, mm -hmm. and they're licensed. They can operate here in New York also. Yes. They're nationwide, right? Yes. Okay. Like, what it would be considered, I know there's been um, breaches of, of HIPAA law and confidentiality and fake, um, the use of fake therapists and fake wellness team, and they targeted my, my, my specific disability and situation, and, and during my vulnerable time just used that to do a biopsychosocial on me, and, and the lady's a social worker, has a social worker license, and is not, not hired to do that job, and, and then use Borealis funds to, to, fund, to fund my personal work that I was doing that was related to the job um, in terms of advocacy, um, but use, you just, just utilize that in a, like, a very deceptive, deceptive way in order to gain like personal, personal information from me and, and using therapy and, and HIPAA laws and all this stuff in order to retract this information. And it was all fraudulent, it was all fake. Were you, were you an employer or were you receiving services from this organization? Both. And you were terminated by them in June 2020. You said, why specifically? Because I reported a crime against me. They didn't, they don't have no reason to fire me. I got, I got pay increases, I've been, I've just had a recent evaluation done. I've been excelling in my role, in my job. There's no reason to fire me. They fired me because I exposed the infiltration and, and the illegal fraud that was being done to use my personal experience, my vulnerable moment for this wellness team and extract information out of me that they wouldn't otherwise have. Who did you report the crime to? To HR. Okay. So you went directly to the human resources of the organization and you're saying you were terminated and retaliation of that? Yes, and they didn't even retaliate against me immediately. They, I became the person surveilled and monitored. They, they disabled my access to my email so that I couldn't contact no other staff person. They, they at, um, you know, because I was doing my job from my laptop, the laptop they provided me with because it's a virtual organization, they wiped out my access to my laptop, you know. And at the time, I was on... Um, I was taking vacation time. I had taken six weeks off due and just recently being released off of parole. But like all of that stuff that was already surfacing for the advocacy work that I was doing, it was a, it was a lot that was happening. So I was um, out of work for six weeks when this stuff was happening and when I reported it. So they waited until I got off of um, after disabling my email and disabling my, my computer. They waited until I came back from vacation. Um, weeks later to fire me. They fired me on my day back and return from work with no reason. They, they, they offered me severance pay and everything, but the severance pay was to say um, they, they're going to give me severance pay as long as I don't ever talk about what happened to anybody. I can't write about it in my music or talk about it in my music, and they, they have to um, take all of the devices. that I could keep the devices, but they got to take it retrieve all the information off of it, and then um, put back together the operating system. It just sounded so bizarre to me. So I know, obviously I didn't sign that, that severance letter that was like hush money for the crimes that they've done against me, and I'm supposed to live my life for a couple of dollars forgetting that it happened. It's crazy. And, and the crimes, again, is you're saying specifically? They have extracted, they have used my time of vulnerability. They have hired me on this job for my formerly incarcerated experience. Um, and they have used my experience to their advantage, but when whatever this lady was doing, the director of human resources putting together this wellness team for me, where they have used these times for therapy sessions 
that I really needed help in, ther in therapy, and they try to provide that for me through inside within the organization. And they've extracted all this personal information is a crime because they're not real therapists, and, and they're selling my information to white supremacists that I have been advocating. Huh? How do you know this? <sighs> the white supremacy part that they're selling your personal information. Okay, the selling part is a belief. Because otherwise, there's no reason to work with these people. This organization is a philanthropic organization. So prior to, I don't know, this, this year, maybe a few years ago, 10, 10 years from, this time, from that time, um, the philanthropy space is, is just um, mostly traditionally white. It's a traditionally white space, and they traditionally fund white organizations to, um, to basically resolve the issues of communities of color. So, so our organization through history, they have done their research and, and historically have created this organization, which is 97% black people, black women, and people of color, because we understand that the issues that we have, um, we should be the ones leading. Why? Because the people closest to the problem are usually closest to the solution, but furthest away from the resources. And so maybe real change can happen if you give the funding to the people who are having the problems in their own community to fix, rather than the people outside of that community who are not really going to fix that problem. Instead, just find a way to make money off of it. So that's what our organization was, was, was created for. So I'm formerly incarcerated leading my criminal justice fund. There's someone who's transgender leading a transgender fund, somebody who's immigrant leading the immigration fund, and there's somebody who's handicapped leading the handicap fund. So what happened is they started with me, with this wellness team and the trauma that I was experiencing from my personal experience. And within my role, I have to listen to all of these Black Lives Matter leaders across the country and everything that's happening. It started to trigger what happened in my own case. And I appealed my case nine times because, because, because what happened to me, to, to me was racial injustice, prosecutorial misconduct, um, police misconduct, judicial misconduct. They, they coerced the jury. And, and, and found me guilty of something that I was not guilty for and found me guilty of something that the juror had wrote a note and said they wasn't going to find me guilty of. I had appealed my case nine times and I had already put it behind me. But when I got this job, it started to trigger everything and realized that, wow, like what happened to me is not an accident. And what happened to me was very much deliberate. And it's happening across this country to people that look like me just because they look like me. So I started to speak out about this stuff every, everywhere that I went because I don't think that it's fair that I could be trapped in a, in, a, in a prison for something somebody else did, and I'm criminally liable for another person. On paper, they know I didn't do it, right? The person who did it got away. Um, and to go to prison for 11 years and just watch crimes be done against us. And nobody does nothing. And you were incarcerated here in New York, Ms. Benson? Yes. In every facility, uh, every woman's prison that has ever existed, all five, there's three now. And I have advocated in prison. I have filed over 700 grievances for the crimes that were done against us. I was end up being a, gr a, a grievance clerk. And a sergeant promoted me to that position because I was doing the job without, without the job. And he thought it'd be better if I had the actual position to do it, uh, quote unquote, the right way. So what happened is this job started to trigger all of these experiences to the point that I had joined the uh, No New Jails movement because... They were opposing $11 billion spent on, on new jails in exchange to close Rikers Island, the notorious uh, violent jail here in New York. And so for me, in my experience, I experienced Bayview Correctional Facility that was tailored to be the nicer jail. And it was the nicer jail in, in terms of being more rehabilitative, in terms of the treatment, in terms of everything. How, however, it was number one on the sex offender list. And we were witnessing rape and sexual harassment being taken taking place on a regular basis where officers were bringing in herpes to the women and then they were passing it around to each other type stuff you know so f so for me having this trauma kick up I started to just speak out against I went to the New York Council building and I posed and I and I gave my testimony and my reason for and I went six minutes and they only allow you three minutes they allowed me to go six and a half minutes based on all of the stuff that I had to say about what happened during this time and how 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 unjust this system is and to the degree and the level of which they should not vote for for, for eleven billion dollars in, in in um of taxpayers money to go to jails instead allocate it to the issues that people are really having so that we don't we don't need this as a solution you know like 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm a subject of being in prison wrongfully. So I'm spending time in prison as a guilty person. And I have to watch correctional officers do stuff that they're not supposed to do to people and nobody cares. And so you were released from prison prior to starting at Borealis, correct? Mm-hmm. When were you released? Um, 2015. You began Borealis in November 2008 to, you know, do the work of the non-for-profit organization. You right. worked there from November 2018 to June 2020, and you're claiming that you were... They retaliated against you because you went to HR to express the concerns that you had with what's going on in the company? Yeah, because the company took the, the vulnerability in which I was experiencing these things that would trigger me, that I haven't had these triggers before. You know, um, I've had different kinds of triggers, but um, this started to trigger every, like just everything. And so they, they, they um, my vice president of programs, he always told me that, we don't have any formerly incarcerated people working here, so whatever kicks up for you, um, do let us know so that we can give you the support that we need. So after a few months of suffering on my own, I'm like, I can't do my job at the level that I'm supposed to if I don't say anything, you know? So I started to speak out about what I was experiencing. And in return, um, the vice president had referred me to a therapist who was supposed to be inside of... the organization? Yes, he referred me to a therapist that he allegedly was seeing, right? That he previously had saw. Um, and also a lot of, most most of our staff as well as being diverse, a lot of us are um, a part of the LGBTQ plus community. So this, this therapist was a part of a network that was a part of LGBTQ plus community. Why? Because they felt like there was harm being done if you speak to, um, if someone who is part of LGBTQ plus, plus community is experiencing challenges based on that identity. And so speaking to a therapist who may be, um, you know, heterosexual that doesn't under, really understand those challenges, they can be further harm caused. So this was created for like black and LGBTQ plus people, right? To feel more comfortable where they won't be harmed in places, that spaces traditionally that they previously been harmed in. So I went along with it for that reason, because there's a lot of reasons why I haven't sought therapy prior to that, even though I know I needed it coming home from prison, right? So I speak to this therapist and I spoke to her about three times and I saw her in, 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 I began seeing her in this therapist. I began seeing in, in August of 2019. Yeah, but how did you meet with her? Was it also virtually? No, at first I met with her in her office. Um, maybe it was only one conversation. I was over the phone. That was the last conversation we had, and that was the last time I seen her because I felt like therapy was not actually help helping to heal me. I started to I started to get back into my music, and I started to write about and and rap about, you know, and put my experience in inside along with the data that I've I've collected as well as I. I went to college. I went back to school and got my bachelor's degree in criminal justice and human rights. So it's just all of this stuff, my experience, the experience from school, and then now professional experience. But I've always had a criminal justice professional experience, but not in this magnitude. This is across the country. And this is dealing with like bail reform and police reform, two of the major criminal justice issues. And it's just like, it just like un unleashed a lot of, um, um, like, I don't know what to say. Not like secrets, but theories, you know, like theories that I have had about the system previously has been uncovered. It's an American criminal slavery system. It's not a criminal justice system. And that's why it's functioning in the way that it's functioning. And there's data all across the country that alludes to that, as well as history and everything else. Kicking stuff up to go back over it. Because I've literally, I, I've literally... Um, the last eight months since I've been unemployed, um, have lived my life in fear because of everything that had taken place. You know, it's, it's one thing that I'm starting to share my experience and the work that I'm doing in my personal magnitude, criminal justice wise, to move things along to where it needs to get to, to where people can obviously be held accountable for the crimes, but not 
enslaved at the same time. You know, it's it's a it's a difference in in what's happening in inside of this system. Um, slavery versus paying paying a price for your crime. People should definitely pay prices for their crime, but they shouldn't be enslaved and treated a certain ways just because they're black. Or the public should not be confused that this is a system for for accountability when it's a continuation of slavery. Because there's more to the story, like I told you, and that really kind of like is what really prompted me, like, because it's like, people will hear this story and it sounds kind of berserk, but if you can see what happened in January 6th, you'll know that there are people, white supremacists mainly, that are obviously crazy, and that this is, this, this organization was targeted literally by white supremacists because we are funding organizations that were never funded. So, for instance, in 2016, I wasn't working here, but in, in, in my, my, um, first meeting and in all of our, our staff meetings um, for the job, the president would continue to state that the organization was under attack by white supremacists since 2016 when they started to fund Black Lives Matter. Nobody else was funding Black Lives Matter. Nobody else wanted to fund them. But they did They did fund them. you know. And so once they started to fund them, they started getting death threats, started getting death threats to her house and to her organization, took everybody's name off of off of the web, their names, their website, their emails, everything. So when I started in 2018, it was confusing to me because I had, um, I don't know if they were white supremacists or not, but I've had um, a cyber attacks through my work email and them trying to get me to purchase them things with, with my credit card. So clearly our, our, our data was breached another kind of way and that these things continue to happen. But when you ask me how do I know that my information is being sold to white supremacists, well, I don't know for fact it's being sold, but I could imagine that they have no other reason to extract this kind of information from me, you know, and, and to hire this, this fake wellness team that is literally inside of my personal mind, my personal business, due to my personal trauma, and, they, and, and I'm trying to uncover it. And what, in the beginning, a lot of what they wanted to know is how much I knew about the system. And everybody would tell me that you know so much about the system, they never heard nobody with this deep analysis. And I just believe it's because of the role that I played inside of prison, where it's not safe to write a grievance. But, but not only did I write it, I've actually worked in, as a grievance clerk and filed over 700 grievances for other women. Because women are subjected to rape and sexual harassment and nobody believes it when it happens. Nobody. And, and the grievances get denied because they don't want it to, to get into the public and they don't want a lawsuit to come out because if people really know what's happening in these prisons, maybe something would change. But, but you know, it... It's, it's a lot to get into, but it was after my testimony, and I, my testimony is online um, at the New York City Council building where I thought they was, they was concerned about crimes, and I gave them all the crimes, and I, before January 6th, I told them that all of these correctional officers, they have tattoos of, of black babies on their arm with a noose around their neck. It's, it's the darkest baby that you can see on the whitest arm and the nappiest hair in, in that tattoo. That tattoo artist drew on there, the nappiest here, with a noose around the neck. And, and hundreds of these white correctional officers walk around, it's 30 degrees outside, but their shirt is rolled up to their sh above their shoulders so that you can see that tattoo and know what they stand for. And that's what prison is. That's why they represent that. That's why they wear it. And I thought that people would be concerned out here for what's going on out there so that we could change the system for what it, for what it really is. And have people really pay for their crimes in a, in a way that helps. Organization, or are you looking for some type of prison reform? Well, listen. Obviously, my 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 complaint against the organization. I'm I'm I, I'm passionate about this, so so I don't want to derail from going into stuff that obviously is not even not really necessary for this conversation. But it's kicking back up. I'm literally in this position because I have an opinion of of from my experience. I have an opinion. If my opinion is not true. And, I, and I'm, I'm sharing stuff with my friends online that why are hundreds of my accounts being infiltrated by white supremacists? Why are people stealing images of my friends and saying that they're my friends, have the same name as my friends, posting the same videos as my friends, and friend requesting me, and I'm thinking it's my friends, it's not. These people were luring me to places. They were luring me to their homes. They were luring me to protests. What's luring you to? These, okay, so i'm I'm really trying to be clear and, and have you follow along because there's two things that took place. There was something that took place offline with my own personal advocacy work, and my own personal advocacy work literally consisted once I did that testimony and realized that I've been 
I can't, I cannot go through life holding all of this stuff in. I have to let it go. And I let it go in a place where I thought maybe something would change. All right, so fine, it didn't. But the thing is, what I, what I did was I shared that work with my peers, with formerly incarcerated people and other friends that I've had before, before I got locked up and, 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 and after, right? So that people could see what I was doing. And, 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 and they, could, they could be inspired, they could be encouraged, they could be empowered. It, it, it was a movement to build power and leadership. You know what I'm saying? So that we could escape this life of crime and that we could escape this destination of poverty and see ourselves for who we really are. When we was five years old, we want to know who you're going to be when you're a kid. Yeah, I try to get people to bring them back to that state of mind and to also be empowered by the fact of what I was doing, you know? And so to be targeted by all of these fake accounts, it's hundreds of accounts. You know what I'm saying? There's hundreds of fake accounts pretending to be people that, that, that are friends of mine. And I know a lot of these fake accounts were correctional officers because how else would they know to target specific people? Specific people and say to me specific things. How does this go back to Mario? How does... Have to do? They have to do with this because they funded my work. They promoted my work. And they used my formerly incarcerated experience to educate the organization. To, to create the fund. To move the fund. To gain grantees. And so when I... Um, was having these cyber attacks I shared it with the, with the grantees who were also having cyber attacks you understand and then we had a conversation about oh absolutely so so the type of work that I would be doing yeah it was to um it was mainly for, for grant making, you know what I'm saying? They hired me to do grant making and to use my experience to be able to choose um, which, um, like what work so in the field was worthy of funding. Your experience was going to be something that was going to be up front in the work Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I didn't... So you're saying that they used it against you? They used it against me because by me doing my work within my experience, I started to get triggered. Right, and I started to experience um, trauma, and that trauma has not stopped, because I, like I said, after I testified at the New York City Council building, that's when I started to like have all of these other issues, because now nobody, I just re revealed something that is not supposed to be revealed, you know, and nobody really reveals this to this magnitude because nobody's playing these roles within the prison, and and that was kicking up for me, like you know what I'm saying, so because. I don't know how to really explain this. You dealing specifically with Borealis. Again, they hired this wellness team and they also had previously referred me to a, to a therapist. After they fired me, I need you to know that after speaking to this therapist, this therapist is working with Borealis. So the therapist that I had previously seen back in 2019 in August, that was referred to me by the vice president of Borealis who said that he used to see her. It was not true. She, she tried to put a wrong diagnosis on me because essentially what their wellness team was trying to do was extract as much information as they can. They created this whole suicide scheme and try to make it out right now. But she revealed to me that she was a previous colleague. Where did you see the statements? I saw her via phone. I started seeing her in her office in Manhattan that she no longer has due to COVID. So after I got fired, I started to see her again via phone call, you know, and she was supposed to be documenting all of this because I was in heightened fear for my life because their, their, their staff member, at the same time I'm getting death threats online, their um, staff member has been re retracting a se severe amount of information from me as well as hunting down my address, my physical address, as well as sending me to cult-like training. She used her job to send me to a cult like training that I had to escape. And this, this, this therapist that I seen after getting fired, not knowing that she was connected to them, thinking that she was um, a former therapist of my colleague, like he said, she was supposed to be writing notes on this. She ended up doing the same thing to me that they had planned on doing, which was put a, 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 a fake diagnosis on me 
so that people could think that I was crazy, so that nobody would listen to what I have to say because they're all freaking criminals. And this lady, what she done, after I asked her for, for my notes for the hundredth time, she refused to give me my notes. So I'm like, listen, I can't afford to see you every night. I'm having night and I'm being waking up out of my sleep. So I wrote her email of what we talked about and she immediately slapped the diagnosis on me. And I asked her to take that diagnosis off or tell me what is it that I told you that warrants this diagnosis. And since this is the first time I'm hearing about it, when are we going to have some type of treatment plan for it? If this is in fact what I have. It took her 29 days to take off that incredibly fake diagnosis off of me.